Welcome to At Learninglish 724, The Queen of Spades, Chapter 1. There was a card party at the rooms of Naru Mav of the Horse Guards. The long winter night passed away imperceptibly, and it was five o'clock in the morning before the company sat down to supper. Those who had won ate with a good appetite. The others sat staring absently at their empty plates. When the champagne appeared, however, the conversation became more animated and all took a part in it. And how did you fare, Sorin? asked the host. Oh, I lost, as usual. I must confess that I am unlucky. I play Mirandol. I always keep cool. I never allow anything to put me out, and yet I always lose. And you did not once allow yourself to be tempted to back the red. Your firmness astonishes me. But what do you think of Herman? said one of the guests, pointing to a young engineer. He has never had a card in his hand in his life. He has never in his life laid a wager, and yet he sits here till five o'clock in the morning watching our play. Play interests me very much, said Herman. But I am not in the position to sacrifice the necessary in the hope of winning the superfluous. Herman is a German. He is economical, that is all, observed Tomsky. But if there is one person that I cannot understand, it is my grandmother, the Countess Anna Fedotovna. How so? inquired the guests. I cannot understand, continued Tomsky, how it is that my grandmother does not punt. What is there remarkable about an old lady of eighty not punting? said Narumov. Then you do not know the reason why. No, really. Haven't a faintest idea. Oh, then listen. About sixty years ago, my grandmother went to Paris, where she created quite a sensation. People used to run after her to catch a glimpse of the Muscovite Venus. Richelieu made love to her and my grandmother maintains that he almost blew out his brains in consequence of her cruelty. At that time ladies used to play at Pharaoh. On one occasion at the court, she lost a very considerable sum to the Duke of Orleans. On returning home, my grandmother removed the patches from her face, took off her hoops, informed my grandfather of her loss at the gaming table and ordered him to pay the money. My deceased grandfather, as far as I remember, was a sort of house steward to my grandmother. He dreaded her like fire, but on hearing of such a heavy loss, he almost went out of his mind. He calculated the various sums she had lost and pointed out to her that in six months she had spent half a million francs, that neither their Moscow nor Saratov estates were in Paris, and finally refused point-blank to pay the debt. My grandmother gave him a box on the ear and slept by herself as a sign of her displeasure. The next day she sent for her husband, hoping that this domestic punishment had produced an effect upon him, but she found him inflexible. For the first time in her life, she entered into reasonings and explanations with him, thinking to be able to convince him by pointing out to him that there are debts and debts, and that there is a great difference between a prince and a coachmaker. But it was all in vain. My grandfather still remained obdurate. But the matter did not rest there. My grandmother did not know what to do. 
she had shortly before become acquainted with a very remarkable man. You have heard of Count Saint Germain, about whom so many marvelous stories are told. You know that he represented himself as the wandering Jew, as the discoverer of the elixir of life, of the philosopher's stone, and so forth. Some laughed at him as a charlatan, but Casanova, in his memoirs, says that he was a spy. But be that as it may, Saint Germain, in spite of the mystery surrounding him, was a very fascinating person and was much sought after in the best circles of society. Even to this day, my grandmother retains an affectionate recollection of him and becomes quite angry if anyone speaks disrespectfully of him. My grandmother knew that Saint Germain had large sums of money at his disposal. She resolved to have recourse to him, and she wrote a letter to him asking him to come to her without delay. The queer old man immediately waited upon her and found her overwhelmed with grief. She described to him in the blackest colors the barbarity of her husband and ended by declaring that her whole hope depended upon his friendship and amiability. Saint Germain reflected. I could advance you the sum you want, said he, but I know that you would not rest easy until you had paid me back, and I should not like to bring fresh troubles upon you. But there is another way of getting out of your difficulty. You can win back your money. But, my dear Count, replied my grandmother, I tell you that I haven't any money left. Money is not necessary, replied Saint Germain. Be pleased to listen to me. Then he revealed to her a secret for which each of us would give a good deal. The young officers listened with increased attention. Tomsky lit his pipe, puffed away for a moment, and then continued. That same evening, my grandmother went to Versailles to the Jew de Lorraine. The Duke of Orleans kept a bank. My grandmother excused herself in an offhand manner for not having yet paid her debt. By inventing some little story, and then began to play against him. She chose three cards and played them one after the other. All three won Sonike, said of a card when it wins or loses in the quickest possible time. And my grandmother recovered every farthing that she had lost. Mere chance, said one of the guests, a tale, observed Herman. Perhaps they were marked cards said a third. I do not think so, replied Tomsky gravely. What, said Narumov, you have a grandmother who knows how to hit upon three lucky cards in succession, and you have never yet succeeded in getting the secret of it out of her. That's the deuce of it, replied Tomsky. She had four sons, one of whom was my father. All four were determined gamblers, and yet not to one of them did she ever reveal her secret, although it would not have been a bad thing either for them or for me. But this is what I heard from my uncle, Count Ivan Iliak, and he assured me on his honor that it was true. The late Japlitsky, the same who died in poverty after having squandered millions once lost in his youth. About 300,000 rubles to Zorik, if I remember rightly. He was in despair. My grandmother, who was always very severe upon the extravagance of young men, took pity, however, upon Chaplitsky. She gave him three cards, telling him to play them one after the other. 
at the same time exacting from him a solemn promise that he would never play at cards again as long as he lived. Japlitsky then went to his victorious opponent, and they began a fresh game. On the first card, he staked 50,000 rubles and won Sonica. He doubled the stake and won again. Till at last, by pursuing the same tactics, he won back more than he had lost. But it is time to go to bed. It is a quarter to six already, and indeed it was already beginning to dawn. The young men emptied their glasses and then took leave of each other. Thank you for listening to today's story on Learn English 724. To improve your English vocabulary and comprehension, we recommend listening to this story multiple times. By repeating the story and practicing the words and phrases, you will better understand and remember them. Keep practicing and see your English skills grow. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment below. See you in the next video.